I'm, I'm going to ask you to open to two places in the Bible as we get started. And this is going to be a sermon in two parts. I have 15 points to this outline, but rather than unload it all on you today, I'm going to give you eight points, and we'll pick up the other seven, God willing, next week. But uh, first of all, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 130. Psalm 119, verse 130. It says there, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It, that is the entrance of it, not the perfect knowledge of it, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Now I'll run all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, and verse 3, we read there, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. These two verses, coupled together, suggest that there's a blessing and a benefit just from reading the Bible, just from being exposed to its language. Uh, this is consistent with what we, how we approach Romans 12, verse 2, which states, Be not conformed to this world. You're supposed to be a nonconformist as a Christian. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, you want to be sure of it, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, a big problem today is, and, and among not just unsaved people, but even saved people, is that they're woefully ignorant of the Bible. I mean, they don't read it, uh, they don't certainly don't memorize it, and uh, ministers stand up and they don't have their congregations turn to the scriptures so they can read it uh, off the page for themselves. And the reason they don't do that is because everybody's using a different translation and none of them read the same way. So a minister doesn't dare say, open your Bibles to a certain verse because they're all using multiple versions. And what he reads wouldn't be what they read on the page. And so ministers are in the habit of just paraphrasing the scriptures for their audience. The Bible says this, that, and the other without actually showing it to them on the page of their own Bible. And so people are, are despicably, and I say despicably, ignorant of the Bible because it didn't used to be that way. Years ago, I mean years even before my, my time, years ago an unsaved drunk on the streets of Los Angeles would know more of the Bible than uh, a lot of saved people do today because he'd been exposed to it. He'd been taught it when he was growing up in school, public school. The public schools of California used to regard the Bible quite greatly. And uh, they used uh, books that taught Christmas carols and uh, stories about Jesus as illustrations to their students, and not anymore, not anymore. And uh, in fact, uh, I would dare say that a lot of public schools many years ago probably taught more of the Bible than many Christian schools do today. This is how bad things have gotten. However, excuse me again, uh, the more ignorant people become of the Bible, the less effort it takes for you to display yourself as if you were a Bible scholar. That first verse there, uh, Psalm 119, verse 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple, if you get into a conversation with some so-called Christian friend of yours at school or at work, and you simply quote that and cite the chapter and verse to them, you already know, one, and that might be the only verse you know, but you already know 100% more verses than they do. They don't know any. And they will think that you are a well-studied Bible scholar. This is how easy it is. It's called winning with deception and bluff. But uh, be that as it is, they're unappreciative. They don't, they don't recognize how important and how vital the Word of God is to their walk with the Lord. And I call this sermon, The Emblems of the Scriptures. The Emblems of the Scriptures. An emblem 
is an object that's used to symbolize or represent the qualities of something else. The American flag is an emblem of the whole United States and everything that it's composed of. So I call this the emblems of the scriptures, and uh, all of these following items are drawn directly from the Bible. And let me just run through the list today. Uh, emblem number one, the Bible is likened unto a mirror, a mirror. James 1, verses 23 through 25. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. For whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The word of God is like a mirror, so you can see yourself, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. Um, the Bible describes the greatness of God and the holiness of God, and it reveals your unholiness by contrast to Him. It shows you exactly what you are alongside a holy and a perfect God. And it describes the weaknesses of your flesh, the elements of your pride, and it indicates what might be out of order that needs to be fixed as a Christian. I have a whole sermon called The Mirror of God's Word. And uh, I go through a number of points. Uh, first of all, uh, the first thing you need when looking into a mirror is light. You can't stare into the bathroom mirror with just the hallway light on. You don't have enough light to see what you're doing. And uh, you need a proper mirror. You can't comb your hair looking into the side of a toaster, right? Or the refrigerator. Uh, you need to look into a mirror every day. To make sure you're still okay. Uh, and... Uh, and you need to be honest and accept what you see. You know, when you look into a mirror, if the part of your hair is on the right side, the mirror is going to show it on your left side, right? So the Bible doesn't sugarcoat it for your benefit to make you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And uh, there's points along that line. But uh, it describes the weaknesses of your flesh and the elements of your pride and other things. So in that respect, in that respect, the Bible does give uh, understanding and light to the person who reads it, just reads it, spends time with it. Secondly, the Bible is likened uh, to seed. Seed, S-E-E-D. Matthew 13, verses 3 through 8. Christ preached, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much uh, earth. And forthwith they sprung up, because they had no uh, deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And later, the Lord identified the seed as the word of the kingdom, Matthew 13, verse 19. The different conditions represent the different conditions and attitudes of the heart. You know, some people are hostile to the gospel when they're exposed to it. Others receive it with a great joy and happiness. Peter wrote, you know, when our young people preach on the sidewalks, when you're preaching on the street corner um, and you're yelling and telling someone, hey, the Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, they think you're attacking them personally. They get very upset. But, uh, but some people, it gives them food for thought. It gives them a reason to stop and think, well, maybe we ought to go back to church. Maybe we ought to read the Bible. Maybe we ought to do some things that I used to do and I've fallen out of the habit of doing. So you never can tell, but the word of God is received differently by different people. Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, like your flesh, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter 2, or, or 1, verse 23. Um, the famous atheist and evolutionist Richard Dawkins says he wants people to read the Bible so they can see how ridiculous it is. But it doesn't always work out that way. The Bible is able to prick the heart, prick the conscience of someone who 
if they go to the Bible and say, I'm willing to read it and keep an open mind and see what it's all about, the Word of God then begins to plant seed in that heart. And eventually they have to decide what to do with that knowledge. But the Bible is likened to seed. The third emblem of the Bible today is the Bible is like water. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. If a man has a seed of the gospel planted in his heart, and he keeps reading the Bible, the Bible has a way of watering its own seed. It waters what's already been planted there. And it's the Word of God that washes and cleanses the local church. It's the Word of God that washes and cleanses an individual Christian and even helps uh, hold a marriage together. He says, he talks about husbands and wives there. I'm so glad that my wife reads her Bible on her own. She and I can't read the Bible for each other. I can't read your Bible for you, nor can you read mine for me. And um, you want to marry someone like that one day who regards the Bible as the perfect Word of God and wants to know it and wants to live by it and wants to learn it and uh, puts it on and elevates it to a place that it belongs, where it belongs. Fourthly, the Bible is called a lamp. A lamp. Psalm 119 Verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, like a good flashlight on a dark night. So, uh, Proverbs 6, verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. I read an interesting article earlier this week when I was sitting in a doctor's office on light therapy. How many have heard of light therapy or read about it? Nobody? I guess I'm the only smart one here today. <laughs> anyway, what it is is the, the bombardment of the body or the skin particularly with certain colors of light for uh, medical as medical treatment. And uh, the article uh, described they're using blue light to combat severe acne in people. Not just young people, but a lot of older people get it too. And uh, red light to treat age lines and uh, reduce wrinkles. Some of you older folks might be interested in that one. They're using green light, which seems to reduce pain and helps to reduce migraines. Um, they're even using infrared light to help treat dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And this is an ongoing uh, developing uh, uh, research. Um, but our opening text today said, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Uh, that's mental, that's spiritual understanding or enlightenment. And this article reported that regular exposure to bright white light and also orange light, particularly, particularly through the eye, can boost your emotional mood and help to improve cognition. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. The Lord Jesus said, if, thy, um, uh, if the light be darkness, the whole body is filled with darkness, right? And one of the best therapies for people with uh, emotional and mental problems, I would say, uh, would be to get their nose into a Bible and start reading it and crowd out all the other stuff that they've been filling their mind with. Uh, the entrance of thy words giveth light. The fifth emblem this morning of the scriptures is this. The Bible is called a sword. A sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And uh, the Bible says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, 
which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The Bible is an offensive weapon uh, in spiritual warfare in, in two respects. Uh, it's offensive because you use it to launch an attack first. And secondly, it's offensive because people get offended by it. And they really do. As I said earlier, you tell them on the street corner they're going to hell without Jesus Christ because the Word of God says so. They think you're attacking them. You're not attacking them. The Word of God's attacking them. The Word of God stands against somebody who tries to justify himself or justify his own actions, his own goodness, his own personality, his winning smile, and all that junk he thinks is going to get him into heaven. And it's not going to get him anywhere but hell or a lake of fire. And the Word of God stands against someone who's filled with their own pride. And they don't like it. And like I said earlier, the Word of God is able to prick the conscience and lay open uh, and lay bare the real things, the truth of things. Take, for example, this whole uh, idea of same-sex marriage, right? Blech. Men with men, women with women. And some of these liberal... Protestant denominations who support that and encourage that. The Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, God likens the husband and wife, a man and a woman, to the relationship between Christ and his church, his bride. You couldn't offend a holy God any worse uh, than by saying two men or two women is equal to that. Because that's the model he uses to uh, teach us about Christ's love for his bride, the church. See, the Bible is able to cut right through it. Just quote a few verses out of Ephesians 5 to some perverted Protestant minister who's not born again uh, and does has no regard for the scriptures, and you'll cut them right to the heart and say, you know why you support that subject is because you're full of the devil and you have no scripture or understanding at all. Point number six, the Bible is likened to gold. Psalm 119, verse 127. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Uh, you don't consider your, rather, don't you consider your Bible to be the most valuable thing you have? You ought to. You ought to. Wealth and worldly uh, riches are fleeting. They're temporary. They can come and go. Sure, we want to plan for the future. We want to safeguard what we have and maybe leave it to our children one day. Uh, and we don't want to run out of money. That's true for anybody. But if you lost your Bible, would you be devastated? Would you feel devastated? Yep. Uh, when we were living in Florida and I was going to Bible school, I had about a year's worth of study notes in the margin of my Bible. And uh, the kids were small, and I was putting, I think, one of our kids in their car seat in the, in, when we were leaving church that day, and put my Bible on the roof of the car to do that. And uh, we drove off, and I left the Bible up there, and it fell off in the nine-mile road in Pensacola there. And I went back and looked. I couldn't find it. Fortunately, a guy found that in the road. And I had my phone number inside the front cover. He called me, and I was able to go pick it up from him. And I thank the Lord for that. But I had about a year's worth of study notes in the margins. I didn't want to lose those. And uh, so I got a cover on the next Bible and to say, I don't want that to ever happen again. But strange, And the strange thing is, uh, I did put it up there a second time. Uh, it did happen a second time. And someone called and Return it to me. <laughs> but uh, the more you read it, the more you study it, the more you memorize it, the more you pray over it, the more you rejoice over it, the more valuable it becomes Amen. to you. It's good to be acquainted with your Bible. You know, Roman Catholics have statues, and they have images, and they have candles, and they have incense, and they have all sorts of symbols and objects that are supposed to, this is supposed to symbolize this, that symbolize that, these things symbolize something else, and um, 
they have all of these tactile images that they touch and they hold and they feel, and they're supposed to generate some spiritual uh, life in them. But God only gave you and I one physical object that we hold in our hands and touch and hold and interact with, and it's the Word of God. It's our Bibles. And it's good to know your Bible, and uh, even if you don't, you forget the exact reference of a verse, you know that it's in a certain book, and there's two columns on both, both sides, and you know it's on the right page on the left column, about halfway down. And uh, so it's easy to find, and after a while that, that India paper begins to get darkened from your, the oil in your skin. And um, reading the Bible can become a very emotional thing, like you're, you're talking with your very best friend. And God's talking to you through it. But uh, the Bible is like to gold. It's very valuable to you. Second, uh, Number seven, along these same lines, the Bible is likened to silver. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. After gold, the second most valuable element in the world is silver. Uh, both gold and silver are reduced down to a liquid or a molten state. And then anything that's impure uh, rises to the surface and they skim and they, they uh, separate that out of it. Well, think of uh, your Bible as having been refined that way seven times before God put it into your hands. That's how you're supposed to think of it as a Bible believer. You ought to think of the book you have as being pure. I had a guy call me two days ago who uh, has watched our sermons, watched a lot of Pastor Gene Ha's sermons on the internet. But this guy began to tell me how much pot he'd smoked and pornography and other problems he had. And he's trying to get himself straightened, straightened out and squared away. But uh, he said, now I'm not one of those that's like King James only, but I, I read the Bible, you know, the King James Bible. And uh, I didn't have time to talk. You know, you're running low and your, your battery's getting low on your cell phone. So I said, let me, let me look through some scriptures. Uh, I was in my car at the time. I'll call you back in a couple of days. Maybe I can give you some verses that'll help you. But I got to tell them, uh, until you decide which book's the Word of God, um, that's your first mistake. You got to decide which Bible's the Word of God. If you don't believe any single Bible is the perfect Word of God, then, then none of them can help, can help you. You have to believe that what you're reading is the Word of God and you're in submission to it, not the other way around. And um, so the Bible is pure, purified by God and made uh, perfect and without flaw or blemish. And he put it into our hands so that we can then have direct access to him and his goodness and grace. Point number eight, and lastly for today, emblem number eight, the Bible is like fire. Jeremiah 20, 20 verse nine. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing. And I could not stay. It is, he couldn't help but preach the word. Some disciples later said about the risen Christ, Did not our heart burn within us when we talked with him by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Luke 24, verse 32. Like the, we've mentioned in a couple of points, the word of God can take root in the mind and in the heart of someone until they can't rest, until they resolve the questions that it raises. The Mormons teach that if you read the Book of Mormon, God will send you a, a burning in the bosom to confirm that it's true. This is how you uh, are convinced of it. Of course, it could just be gas or heartburn from a burrito or too much uh, pizza the night before. And yet, uh, truthfully, um, the more you learn the Word of God, and the more you um, think of how God saved you, and how God forgave your sins, you want to tell somebody else about it. 
You can't keep it to yourself. And you're praying for God to, for every opportunity God sends you, that you'll make the, make the best adva- take the best advantage of it and make the best use of it. Did I answer someone? It might just be answering someone's Bible question. And like I said, if you quote a verse and cite the chapter and the verse number, that's about all it takes nowadays for someone else to think, that guy really knows the Bible. If I have a question, I can go to him. I worked with a guy years ago, and I hadn't gone to Bible school. I, I was just you know, reading the Bible every day and before work. And it just came out in conversation. And, and he had already earned a master's degree down at Biola University. But uh, he liked to hang around me because I knew the Bible and uh, nobody else in the workplace did. And uh, we went out to, to uh, dinner one night. And he said, you know, Mike, you know the Bible better than anyone I've ever met. Which I didn't know how to take because I, I didn't think of myself like that. But um, he knew that if he had a question, he could come and ask me what the answer might be. Because evidently he hadn't been taught it uh, in Bible college. I worked with another guy in another job. This was after I came back here from Florida. And I have another Christian, and we just making conversation. I'd pick him up because he needed, we kind of carpool. I'd pick him up and then give him a ride back home after work. And he was asking me a question about a certain verse in his men's Bible group at his church. And just off the top of my head, I was able to say, well, you know, the context of that is this, that, this. And I said, this verse above it says such and such, so you want to pay attention to that. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. I I forget the subject now, but it just came out of me like that. And um, a few days later, he said after after talking to me, he thought, man, that guy is rich. He knows the Bible. What a funny thing to know the Bible, right? (laughs) What a strange thing to go right to the source and see what God has to say. Nobody does that. They go to magazines, they go to the internet, they go to all kinds of things to find the answer to their problems. I don't know how many... I, I had a guy that ordered a copy of my book uh, last year, and ever since then he's been texting me about every other day with some new question uh, from the Bible. And, and very often I'm thinking, why do I have to answer that question that's a very simple, all you get in the Bible, good, good concordance. You know, a good concordance and a good dictionary are two of the best tools to learning the Word of God. Amen. Get a concordance and run through every verse that uses that word and see what the total Bible's uh, uh, teaching is on that subject. That's a Bible doctrine. The whole Bible's teaching on any given subject. But uh, it's you'd think it'd be a very simple proposition, but... It eludes so many Christians these days. And uh, the power and the influence of the Bible can spread like wildfire. It burns in your heart. You want to tell somebody else. You want to take what you've read in the scriptures and and convey it to someone else and explain to them how to understand it or what to think of it, what to make of it. Um, After its publication in 1611... Uh, it began to spread around the world. This is how I know the King James Bible is the Word of God. Because it began to spread like a brush fire all around the world. The greatest period of uh, British expansionism came in the 1700s and the early 1800s. They used to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. As every time zone around the world covered some territory that was controlled by the Empire of Great Britain. And uh, all of those, by that time, the King James Bible had uh, overwhelmed the English language, and they were taking that Bible everywhere they went. When, they, uh, when, when India was a British-dominated country, they had the King James Bible being preached there. And everywhere else. That was the Bible. You couldn't, you couldn't even get a spark out of the NIV to set a fire or the New Living Translation, or Kenneth Taylor's Living Bible, you couldn't start a, you couldn't light a birthday cake with, uh, with either, any of those. 
let alone start a brush fire. And yet the King James Bible continues to spread. You know, as I said before, the King James Bible is the only one the astronauts took around the moon and brought back, the Apollo 8 mission. And all of those three astronauts were unsaved Roman Catholics. But they took the right Bible with them because God was involved in it. The Bible spreads like fire, and it burns in the heart of someone who reads it until he can't sit still. He's got to tell somebody what he's read, what he's learned, what he knows about the scriptures, what he knows about God now because he's been reading it.